Uh, we're going to begin. Um, welcome everyone here and those online uh, to this um, uh, gathering this afternoon focused on the new uh, Institute of Medicine study, this groundbreaking study on falsified and substandard drugs. And congratulations to IOM and to the Food and Drug Administration for this um, very, very important piece of work. I hope you've had a chance uh, to look at it. And we're certainly going to hear a great deal about it um, this afternoon. And we have a, uh, a terrific uh, group uh, assembled here. I want to especially thank uh, Todd Summers, the senior advisor and colleague here at CSIS, who will be moderating the discussion for pulling all of this together. I also want to thank a number of other people who made quite a contribution in, 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 in bringing us together, Kate Bond uh, and Kenesha Peters, uh, Kate Bond from FDA, uh, Jillian Buckley and Kenesha Peters from IOM, and Alicia Kramer and um, and Rachel Wood uh, from our staff here at CSIS. Uh, this is a very big problem, as we'll hear. Uh, it's uh, fundamentally and, and in very complicated ways tied to U.S. national interests, both at home and abroad, and we'll hear more about that. It's also very integral to a, uh, to, uh, to a quickly evolving public good, global public good, that requires us to, uh, to engage and think as a country uh, about this problem and what remedies might work in new and different ways. Um, we've had the good fortune to cooperate with uh, Dr. Hamburg and the staff of FDA in previous sessions looking at the uh, expanded uh, globalization agenda of FDA, and, uh, and it's been fascinating. And we've had the opportunity to visit with FDA staff in Beijing uh, last fall, which was also fascinating, and to discuss here um, the, the dramatic new challenges that FDA faces in trying to meet uh, the uh, targets and the concerns that Congress is setting forth and the demands that come forward uh, naturally uh, in this environment in trying to both ensure the, uh, the, the safety of American public with respect to drugs and food, but also to contribute to greater capacity building among our partner countries. So coming forward to talk about this particular problem Today, um, it follows on a trail of work that we've developed over the last couple of years in close partnership uh, with FDA. We're also thrilled to partner with the Institute of Medicine. We'll be doing another session uh, tomorrow afternoon on the IOM study of PEPFAR, um, which I hope you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, we're delighted to have our, our, our four speakers, um, uh, Deborah Autor, the Deputy Commissioner for Global Regulatory Operations and Policy at US FDA will open it up with um, some uh, uh, prepared remarks. Um, she um, uh, is, has been the head of that directorate since 2011, uh, and, and, and that puts her really at the center of all of the thinking uh, and implementation of the globalization and import safety strategy globally uh, for FDA. She's been with FDA since 2002 and has served in a number of very senior positions. And Deborah, thank you so much for taking time out to be with us today. Um, following uh, Deborah, we'll hear from uh, Professor Larry Gostin, who was uh, very instrumental in the completion of this and the execution of this particular study. Larry's known to many of you here, I'm certain, uh, for his role at Georgetown and particularly in leading the O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law. Uh, we've had the great fortune of partnering at different times with some of the students, the graduate students that have come in and interned with us and enormously benefited from that collaboration. We want to see more of that, I hope. Um, and um, Larry has also played um, uh, very important roles with WHO uh, in different advisory uh, 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 settings uh, for the Secretary General for the Director General for um, uh, IHR, International Health Regulations, and other, other items. Uh, after those two presentations, we'll move to a round table, and Todd will take, take over, and we'll be joined at that point um, by two other guests who've come to be with us today. Uh, Mr. D D Dilip Shah uh, is here. He took time out of personal vacation here in North America to join us. Thank you very much, Dilip. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Vision Consulting Group, uh, um, a strategic planning firm in India. 
Uh, he has ha 44 years of extensive experience, 30 years with Pfizer India. Uh, he formed Vision in 1997, uh, and in that, in, since that time has served on many uh, uh, key uh, uh, associational groups within India that have brought forward the perspective of the industry. Uh, he's the chair of the management committee of the International Generic Pharmaceutical Alliance and secretary general of the Indian Pharmaceutical Alliance, among other duties. Uh, thank you, Dilip, for being with us. Um, we are also our fourth our fourth uh, speaker today is Dora Akunyili. Thank you, Dora, for being with us. Uh, for those of us who work on Nigeria, and there are several people here in this building, including myself, who've spent a lot of time working on Nigeria, Dora is a very famous personality for her courage, uh, for the record that she uh, 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 earned uh, in Nigeria as the head of the Nigerian FDA, uh, in which she uh, put herself at enormous risk uh, and really became uh, a beacon of what is possible in, in attempting to create these kinds of capacities under very difficult circumstances. And Dora, it's just, it's just a delight to have you here today um, with us. Uh, I did have a chance to look at the report and read it over, uh, over the course of the uh, weekend. I just want to share a couple of big impressions that came across in just reading through it. Um, one is just the how elusive this problem is. It's so big, but it is elusive. And when I say elusive, I mean that it seems to still defy precision in measurement and data. It's still a highly prob problematic field. We recognize its importance, but we still struggle to put our arms around this and, and to quantify and to, and to, and to uh, build the factual basis around it. Uh, this is a very fundamental problem. Uh, that we face here, and in, in just definitional, uh, in, in defining the scope and nature of the problem. A second related impression is the number of times that the word confusion and the word chaos is used in the text, uh, throughout the text, which I think is again emblematic uh, of something out there that is in the nature of this marketplace, that it is confusing, it is chaotic, it defies uh, quick generalizations and it, and it defies easy, easy analysis and measurement. A third is the excessive attention to definitional issues. Um, and this is part, in part the, sensitivity, the sensitivities around trips and patent and trademark infringement issues, the divisions between, within industry and the divisions between industry and governments and interest groups. Um, it also signals, I think, that we're still at early days. And I think that the report itself carries us forward in a very dramatic and constructive way in trying to arrive at a consensus definition that people can begin uh, to use. Um, I, I was very encouraged to see that, to read in considerable detail, that we are making substantial progress in quantifying the impacts with respect to malaria control. Uh, and I hope we'll hear more about that. Uh, and the way in which people are beginning to be, make factually correct or defensible assertions around the link of this problem uh, to resistance. Um, and that th there are dollar amounts quantifying the estimated um, uh, value of the substandard falsified, um, the $400 million figure. Um, the uncertainty and continued high, in, high, uh, high tension uh, in how do you engage industry and how do you bring industry into these uh, formulations? It's very fundamental. There's discussion around uh, the Pharmaceutical Security Institute and the data that is held. There's discussion around the degree to which incentives keep governments and industry uh, from re not wanting to share in a timely fashion. How do you change those incentives? And as I said earlier, this, the extreme sensitivity and controversy surrounding uh, trademarks, infringement, and patents, which can, which can become a great difficulty here. Finally, I'd say it left me with a very strong question around how is it really that you motivate governments and regulatory agencies to, to make a greater investment in the capacities of regulatory agencies and to create some kind of effective global coalition that is going to be essential in the future. And I think, again, we're at very early days. I think that FDA and Dr. Hamburg deserve enormous credit for trying to stimulate 
the, the early discussions across a spectrum of 10 or 12 key regulatory agency leaders, including some of those like China, that are very vital to the solutions. So please join me in thanking uh, Todd and our four distinguished uh, speakers today. Uh, and I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Autor to kick things off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. That was a terrific introduction and uh, overview. A lot of good insights from the report. And I also want to uh, thank you, Steve, and Todd, and Jillian, and Meg, from uh, and Patrick Kelly from the IOM for pulling together this meeting. Uh, and of course, Larry Gostin, who chaired the IOM committee, for taking on uh, such an important task. And I was sitting here reflecting um, and thinking back to when we first at FDA thought about asking to have this report done. And it was around the summer of 2011. And it struck me that actually a lot has changed since. Because the discussion at that point was, we've reached an impasse on definitional issues and on just about everything. And so we need to find a way to get other people looking at this issue and thinking about this issue. And now, a couple years down the road with the report out, we've actually, I think, moved pretty far beyond that. Not only did you address the nomenclature issue, which is, of course, an important one, but that one seems to be one where, that we're getting past, I think, globally, if I can say optimistically. And you were able to come up with a lot of very good recommendations for uh, what a lot of stakeholders can do together to address this problem. And we have the WHO member state mechanism and other things underway. So uh, I'm actually feeling pretty optimistic uh, sitting here thinking about that. I do want to say what I think is probably well known to people in this room, but uh, those of us sitting here can rest assured that the U.S. prescription medicine supply chain is one of the safest in the world. We're fortunate to have a strong regulatory framework here governing the production and distribution of medicines. And, and as I work more and more globally, I learn more and more about how fortunate we really are. Global medical supply chains rely upon a complex web of component suppliers, repackers, distributors, and a variety of locations with varying rules and regulations, and they are increasingly at risk. Criminals take advantage of vulnerabilities in the system by engaging in drug counterfeiting, diversion, cargo theft, economically motivated adulteration, and all of these are threats. Substandard falsified and counterfeit medical products, and I still use the term counterfeit because it's in our law, but um, I, I like, uh, I'm comfortable with substandard and falsified as well because I think it captures um, you know, a big range of what we need to capture. SFC medical products pose both direct and indirect threats to public health. They may contain too much active ingredient, too little, no active ingredient, the wrong active ingredient, or they may even be toxic. They may contribute to increased drug resistance and prevent patients from getting the medical products they need to alleviate suffering and prevent death. The risks to consumers are real around the world and in this country as well. Uh, in 2012, we found counterfeit versions of the injectable cancer medication Avastin. In the U.S., it came from medical clinics um, who purchased it from both U.S.-based and foreign distributors. That product contained no active ingredient whatsoever. So people with cancer were getting treatment that was not treatment at all. And there have been other incidents of counterfeit medicine in the U.S. as well. No country is immune from this problem. But these risks, I would submit, are even more pronounced in low- and middle-income countries. And as the study shows, and as you will hear more from Larry and from other panelists, this is a real risk. Threats to the compromised drug integrity and supply chain security present a global problem, and no one regulatory authority or health system can work in a vacuum. None of us can do this alone to curtail these threats. And Steve was kind enough to uh, talk about global coalitions, which I think are a very, very important issue uh, that we need to continue to talk about. How can we tackle this problem together? Our success or failure in addressing this challenge will depend on the relationships that we forge and the networks that we develop. Now, what we've been thinking about at FDA is what is our framework for taking all of these different actions, all of these different recommendations, and laying them out in a way that makes sense to us? And we've focused on prevention through strengthened regulatory capacity and tightened supply chains, early and rapid detection of suspicious products, and collective response when SFC medical products are found. So we need a global product safety net that protects consumers by reducing public health risks caused by SFC products, and again, through prevention, detection, and response, we think we can continue to get closer and closer to that. Critical to this effort will be effective leveraging, collaboration, and information sharing among regulatory and law enforcement agencies, 
Increased public awareness and vigilance of stakeholders, including healthcare providers and patients, is also of paramount importance. So why did the FDA commission the IOM to undertake this study? We wanted to advance the global dialogue on how to combat this challenge from a public health perspective. We wanted to enlist a broad range of stakeholders in this response. And we greatly appreciate the depth and breadth uh, represented in the IOM committee and think you did an incredibly thoughtful uh, job providing recommendations which do make that happen. And so we're, we're thrilled to see that happen. And uh, we've thanked the committee privately, but it gives us an opportunity to do it publicly as well. We think it's a really important piece of work that helps all of us to continue this key discussion. So what FDA sees is needed steps. First, the need to prevent market entry, because that's how consumers and patients are exposed to SFC medical products. We prevent market entry by reducing the manufacture and distribution of SFC products and by improving supply chain integrity. So the IOM report goes into considerable depth about why low and middle income countries are particularly vulnerable to SFC products. The regulatory oversight is limited and there are numerous vulnerabilities. For this audience, we're interested in talking about the IOM recommendations aimed at reducing those vulnerabilities and the suggestion that the global health and economic development sector has a key role to play. The recommendations include increasing global investment in upgrading pharmaceutical manufacturing to high quality standards, strengthening private sector distribution channels, increasing the use by procurement agencies of international procurement standards, and again, the all important increase in public awareness. So we very much look forward to hearing what the panel and the audience have to suggest in this regard. It's also really important to note that industry and regulatory authorities have a key role to play in improving supply chain integrity. Industry accountability for product quality and safety throughout the entire product life cycle and compliance with applicable laws and regulations, particularly incorporating good practices, I would say best practices, is essential. It's also important for industry to properly secure and dispose of expired or recalled products, as well as outdated equipment. Uh, we found that equipment uh, out there can become a tool for counterfeiting. And I will say we've greatly benefited from the liaison between industry and law enforcement and had had a number of very significant criminal SFC investigations that have been the result of cooperation with industry. So there really are good partnerships. Improvements in drug integrity and supply chain integrity will be brought about by strength and oversight by regulators in areas with robust regulatory frameworks and those with developing regulatory frameworks. Regulatory authorities help prevention efforts by developing, promoting, and improving compliance with guidelines and with regulations. An example of this is the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation uh, that's working on developing and implementing a roadmap for improving supply chain security. So an opportunity to step back and look at what is out there that's working and where the gaps are and what the strategies are going forward. In addition to preventing market entry, as I said, another key component is detection. We need to detect SFC products if they do enter the market. This means active surveillance, effective investigation, and efficient uh, confirmation if possible of the product for SFC. The building blocks of surveillance and investigation are pharmacovigilance systems, technologies, and also laboratory capacity. So together we need to work to build as many of these as we can. And pharmacovigilance in particular is one of those things that I think cannot be done in any one country because these products are not confined to any one country. We have global drugs. We need global systems to detect and to prevent. The study does highlight FDA's collaboration with the WHO in developing a global monitoring surveillance system, which we think will help to identify incidents and to monitor trends and patterns that contribute to our prevention, detection, and response efforts. And finally, if products do enter the market, we need to rapidly detect that they're SFC products and rapidly respond so that we can protect patients as much as possible. We need to notify partners and patients about incidents, ensure the bad product is quickly removed from the market, improve containment of the product so they do not re-enter the supply chain, and take enforcement action so that we can reduce the number of bad actors. So a good example of this Operation Pangea 2012, FDA partnered with international regulatory and law enforcement agencies from 100 countries and sent warning letters to more than 4,100 internet sites that were illegally selling potentially dangerous unapproved drugs to consumers. Again, it takes a global effort because it is a global problem. And the agency has developed Be Safe Rx, which is our campaign to communicate to both consumers and healthcare practitioners the risks associated with purchasing from unlicensed pharmacies. So I just wanted to take a moment to give those 
framing remarks uh, and to restate that while the FDA is well on its way, we hope, to implementing many of the IOM's recommendations, we recognize this is a broad, multi-stakeholder effort. Many, many of us have to work individually and together to address this problem. The global threat requires a global response by regulators, industry, consumers, enforcement agencies, healthcare providers, all of us. And so that's why being here today at CSIS is especially important as an opportunity for people from so many sectors to come together and to think about how we can each work on this problem, how we can each address it, how we can best protect patients around the world. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to uh, just begin by uh, reiterating Deb's uh, remarks of uh, thanks to Steve and Todd and your colleagues at CSIS who've uh, not only been a magnificent partners, but I think all of us understand our kind of global leaders in, in, um, in this uh, field and all of global health. And so thank you for your leadership. It's really very much appreciated. Um, the FDA uh, who commissioned this study, I, I do echo uh, Deb's remarks that uh, they are global leaders and have been very brave. And what I particularly love about the, what I like to call the new FDA is, it's re it, is that it's, it's a, a global public health agency in the, in the best of all world, so thanks to Commissioner Hamburg, um, Deb, Kate Bond, uh, Lou Valdez, and others uh, at uh, the FDA for um, uh, magnificent uh, leadership in this field. When we went and uh, briefed the FDA on this report, uh, we had such a stimulating and interesting uh, uh, discussion and strategy uh, forward, and this just takes it um, uh, one step uh, beyond. And then, of course, uh, the IOM. Um, the real brain trust behind this is uh, Jillian Buckley, uh, who is here, and uh, Megan Kanisha, uh, uh, Pat Kelly, and others at the IOM. Uh, and so I'm just the spokesperson uh, for the wonderful work that, that the staff did and, and a really wonderful um, uh, committee did uh, as well. Um, so this is our uh, topic. We uh, spent a lot of effort in gathering information from multiple stakeholders. As Deb said, this really is not just one person's responsibility. It, it goes across stakeholders in public health. It goes to uh, customs, trade, uh, and of course um, to law enforcement, both domestically uh, and internationally, as well as uh, regulatory capacity for um, uh, 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 drug safety. Uh, in individual uh, countries. Um, we visited a number of countries, um, notably um, Brazil uh, and India, uh, and uh, also um, uh, uh, visited with the uh, European Medicine Agency uh, in the UK and, and, and uh, many others. Um, so uh, I think uh, Steve and Deb really made it very easy for me because they went through a lot of this. Uh, but the uh, poor quality medicines um, are a global problem and there has been disagreement on how to frame the problem. And so I think those two ideas uh, are, to me were really um, quite critical. Uh, the one is the fact that it is well established that it's a global problem that became so clear to us uh, in the committee that uh, this was a deep and vast problem. If one looked at a map of how uh, these uh, drugs crisscross around uh, the earth, and if you look about the economic incentives that, that are equal to the illicit drug trade, um, and then you uh, imagine that we actually don't know, we can't quantify it, um, the need for pharmacovigilance uh, nationally and collaboratively among countries um, couldn't be clearer. The other thing that struck me as a, as a lay person to this particular field uh, was just how much the um, lack of common terminology um, was a problem. I think 
the report justifiably spent a lot of time on this because as we talked to different stakeholders, there were a great deal of miscommunications, uh, sometimes mistrust, uh, and uh, much of it, as Steve said, uh, had the, uh, the, the undertext of is this an intellectual property problem? Is it a public health problem? Is it a regulatory problem? Is it a law enforcement problem? And our charge um, from the uh, FDA made it very clear that we were concerned about primarily the public health problem. But of course, in looking at the public health problem, one needs to not only engage the health sector, but also law enforcement, customs, trade, and, and other, uh, and, the, and of course, uh, the industry um, itself. Um, so we had a, uh, we still use the term counterfeit, um, but we use it in its um, proper legal uh, context. Uh, counterfeit uh, drug it, under uh, the um, uh, WTO agreements, the TRIPS agreement, um, is uh, a, a, a violation of a, a trademark. And as a trademark violation, um, it deserves um, scrutiny. But that's only one small part of it. And the problem was is that uh, we were, and I think we have come a long way, but the world, particularly lay people, still talk about counterfeit drugs as a, uh, as a broad uh, umbrella. And that worries uh, uh, folks who are most interested in access to affordable medicines and essential medicines uh, and uh, looking at how TRIPS flexibilities can actually um, help with that. Uh, so we had uh, two broad and overlapping categories of bad drugs, which were um, falsified drugs and substandard drugs. A falsified drug uh, misrepresents uh, the product's identity, source, or both, and a substandard drug fails to meet national specifications to accept the uh, pharmacopoeia or uh, manufacturing dos dossier. Uh, Deb talked about the consequences of uh, illegitimate drugs. Uh, uh, they include toxicity, poisoning, and comp compromised treatments. In many ways, we found that those drugs that had um, uh, an too little active pharmacological ingredients posed a greater problem than those with no active ingredient because uh, when you're taking a sub-therapeutic dose, it promotes uh, resistance. And uh, one could see this with anti-malarial um, medications and others, and including antibiotics. And for those of you who think that this is a problem only for high-priced branded drugs, it's that, but it's also much more. I mean, we found it also in the generics uh, uh, industry because the cost um, of producing the product is so low, and uh, even with very small uh, margins, uh, with antibiotics, for example, there is, there is a huge uh, potential uh, market. Um, consumers lose confidence in medicines and the health system and the regulatory system. We clearly saw that um, in many um, low and middle income countries. And it funds uh, criminal activities and convey, conveys power to corrupt officials. And so corruption um, within, health, within the health sector uh, and corruption uh, with illicit trade, often combined with the illicit drug trade, uh, makes the economic drivers of this particularly um, uh, strong. Uh, as uh, we've all mentioned, uh, the magnitude of the problem is that it disproportionately uh, impacts low and middle income countries. We saw it with anti-malarial, antibiotics, anti-tuberculosis drugs in sub-Saharan Africa and uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and that it tends to circulate more rapidly and more prevalently in countries with weak um, uh, uh, surveillance systems. And so we recommended very strongly uh, the strengthening of drug surveillance systems in developing countries, uh, as WHO is doing with a surveillance capacity building project, which uh, is actually a very innovative model project that the FDA itself um, has uh, 
uh, promoted and funded, um, but it is still just a model and a, a, a pilot um, program. Uh, and we also felt that uh, uh, pharmacovigilance uh, uh, systems should be well integrated with national and global surveillance systems. Um, uh, for example, if one looks at, uh, Steve mentioned the IHR, the International Health Regulations, um, there are you know, increasingly robust ways of uh, trying to track emerging infectious diseases um, that don't exist uh, in the area that we're discussing now. Um, just look at the uh, novel influenza that's currently uh, circulating in China, and you can see the kind of global alert system that uh, is uh, being put into place. And yet, uh, with th this problem, which is uh, arguably as, if not more, serious to the public health, uh, uh, we don't have that kind of robust um, system. Uh, the causes of the problem are um, uh, multifactorial, um, equipment staffing, process costs necessary to meet international um, good manufacturing um, practices, the lack of capital uh, investment and poor infrastructure uh, in uh, low-income countries are a problem, and this is a uh, lack of capacity uh, in regulatory uh, areas, in drug manufacturing, um, in, and uh, uh, particularly with um, uh, smaller um, pharmaceutical companies uh, in the developing world that don't have um, uh, the kind of capacity that's needed. Uh, criminals and dishonest manufacturers exploit the regulatory weaknesses, so they actually go to the areas of the, of the, the, weak, the weakest uh, link in the chain. Uh, and regulators, as Deb mentioned, uh, uh, need uh, training equipment and technology. And the report emphasized the importance of national strategic plans for regulatory um, system um, development. Uh, when one understands this uh, problem in, in its uh, deepest form, as I'm sure many of you do, uh, one can see that the supply chain and trying to secure the supply chain is critical. And the supply train, uh, uh, chain is, is extensive uh, and it's uh, fundamentally global, uh, uh, which makes it, which is why the report uses confusion and chaos uh, so often. I hadn't realized that and, uh, and uh, Jillian and I had a little look at each other <laughs> and said, oh yeah, does it really? Um, uh, in poor countries, uh, there are few uh, quality drug uh, shops outside of cities, so one can go to um, uh, uh, marketplaces uh, in uh, lower income countries and uh, see people buying uh, 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 products. Uh, they, buy, they buy these products because they can't afford um, the high price for them um, or that they're not available through the national um, authorities. Uh, and uh, even though very substantially high uh, rates of um, substandard or falsified drugs are in these markets, um, uh, they continue to have very little option um, but to do that. So if, you, if you're sick with malaria uh, or your child's sick with malaria, you need to do something as a parent um, and uh, the options are, are not great. Uh, we found that the private sector, of course, will invest in medicine retail if there's a good reason to do so. And the report uh, encouraged governments to use franchising, accreditation, low interest loans, training as tools to improve uh, retail and create an environment where the private sector can thrive and can police itself and ensure safe, high quality medicines. In the United States, we, we had a balance in this report because our charge really um, spanned uh, global concerns, but also particularly concerns uh, that the FDA is primarily uh, charged to do, which is the safety in, in, uh, of America's uh, 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 drug supply. Um, we uh, believe that changes to drug wholesale and tracking systems would help uh, American consumers while also building momentum for tighter controls in other um, parts of the world. 
We also realized that there were technological and legal solutions to this problem, um, making innovative technologies, uh, detection technologies accessible in poor countries, and the report recommended a central uh, repository for detection technologies to identify uh, falsified and substandard drugs. And it also discussed the idea of a small business uh, innovation research program as a way to encourage research drug technologies. There are many um, uh, potentially promising technologies. We need to find new ones, but we also need to find ones that not only work, but are really accessible uh, and can be used on the ground, um, whether they're used by uh, national drug regulators, by the industry itself, by smaller pharmaceutical companies, or by the consumer herself. Um, these technologies uh, can be very important. I think our biggest and boldest recommendation um, was addressed uh, to the World Health Assembly uh, in uh, uh, conjunction um, with uh, other international organizations such as the uh, um, UN Office on Drugs and Crime and the World Customs Organization uh, for an international um, code of practice um, on this problem. Uh, the WHO and others have had fairly good success, uh, it's not perfect, but fairly good success with developing soft norms uh, in the past. Um, the most uh, well-known one, perhaps, is the one on the international migration of uh, health workers, um, but also uh, there are a variety of global strategies on diet, uh, nutrition, and, uh, and uh, other areas. Uh, and even hard law, such as the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. Um, but we thought that the, the world and, and, and international um, uh, uh, community was not quite ready and it wasn't really ripe now to have a global health treaty. And there were two, two nascent uh, health treaties at the regional level that uh, never have gotten off the ground. Uh, and so we thought starting with a soft code of practice would encourage this kind of um, international dialogue um, that's uh, so necessary um, and uh, so helpful. Although I don't have a slide for it, um, Deb mentioned track and trace um, programs. Uh, we recommended that Congress should um, uh, authorize and fund the FDA uh, to do this. It's one of those areas that she mentioned. I think it's terribly important and just simply makes sense um, in the United States to uh, protect consumers. But not only that, but I do think it would also be um, uh, a beacon of leadership for uh, the rest of the world. Uh, and in the interim, we've also suggested that FDA uh, convene uh, stakeholders. Uh, we also talked in the United States about wholesale uh, licensing um, uh, and uh, good manufacturing. Uh, and uh, uh, had a number of proposals that were focused on the United States uh, market. So um, I'll begin, um, uh, I'll, be, I'll end where I began um, by thanking uh, the IOM staff and the IOM committee. Uh, uh, this was truly a, a collective um, uh, effort and we had uh, a really uh, incredibly robust and, and important uh, international group of uh, uh, people from uh, the academy, uh, from uh, industry, uh, from civil society, um, from uh, uh, low and middle income uh, country regulators uh, thinking hard about this problem. And then finally and lastly, of course, to thank the FDA again for giving us this uh, uh, wonderful opportunity to try to make a contribution to this field. Thank you. So we all have uh, portable microphones, so you can turn those on. So I was at Kate Bond's house for dinner, and uh, some people get little party gifts when they go to dinner. I got an IOM report. She handed me this inch-thick stack of paper and said, I'm going to call you on Monday. Give it some, give it some thought. 
Uh, and I did read through it, and frankly, it's, uh, it's exciting, but it's actually a little bit uh, aggravating. It Make, makes you mad when you realize that the mom who raises the dollar and goes down to the little kiosk at the end of the street to deal with a child who probably has <laughs> malaria could very well be buying something that's completely ineffective. Uh, and it's, it's frustrating given how much work goes on here in Washington and around the world and in many of the developing countries to try to make that uh, opportunity uh, meaningful for that uh, family, that there are other people in the world who are trying to subvert that. And really, uh, that was what in some ways drove me uh, to want to get into this a little bit more. Uh, as Steve mentioned early on um, at CSIS, we spent quite a bit of time looking with FDA at a range of issues. We also do a lot of work looking at PEPFAR and PMI and the Global Fund, places where the U.S. taxpayers uh, invest a lot in terms of global health. Those are also potential uh, places, both opportunities and challenges. Uh, the Global Fund gets about a billion and a half dollars a year from the U.S. About uh, 40, 50 percent of that actually goes in to buy medical products. Most of those are actually drugs. Uh, uh, PMI also purchased a lot of antimalarials. PEPFAR purchased a lot of antiretrovirals. So there's a keen interest here in making sure that as we uh, try to make those uh, programs more effective, uh, the least we can do is make sure that if we're buying drugs, that those drugs actually have the potency uh, that we would expect from them. So it's a, it's a very timely and important issue. We were uh, thrilled to have uh, Deb offered to come and participate with us today as, long as, as well as Larry. But we're also particularly happy to have Dora and Delip with us uh, to bring a different perspective. Uh, Dora, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, spent an, uh, some time as the head of the Nigerian FDA. And as I was reading through the report again this morning, all I kept thinking was uh, what an almost impossible job you had. Uh, it's like trying to sail a boat when you know that there's 100 holes uh, in, the, in the hull. It's a very complex problem that goes right from the active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers that are often in different countries down to the little kiosk uh, that's in a village very far away from the public sector. Uh, and, and a lot of that uh, is under the remit of the regulatory uh, associations for the importing countries. And the report notes that a lot of the responsibility is put on those importing countries, but clearly uh, much of that relies on a system outside of the country which is uh, uh, in pieces. So Dora, I wonder if you could start us off a little bit in the conversation with the perspectives from Nigeria. What does the issue of counterfeit and falsified and substandard medicines look like from your side? And since this is a US audience, where do you look to the US for help? Where can we be helpful in, 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 in equipping a Nigeria to play a better role in protecting its citizens? Thank you very much. Well, uh, counterfeit medicine, or generally in Nigeria, we call it fake drugs. It was first noticed in Nigeria in 1968. So it didn't start recent. When uh, Crown Agent divested as the, um, as the uh, drug distributor, official drug distributor, uh, criminals started bringing in counterfeit, and they actually operated on challenge for almost three decades. Uh, and uh, their, their business uh, prospered for them. And uh, people were dying. It was like a hazardous situation. Uh, Thank you. Nobody knew what to do. The regulators were compromised. That's the usual thing. Uh, everybody was bought over. And it continued until it became so hopeless that Nigeria actually became uh, the country with the highest incidence of counterfeit or fake medicine in the whole world. Uh, until I came into that, the leadership of our regulatory agency in 2001 um, and started waging a war against these people. Uh, we needed to put structures in place. We needed to, we needed to confront them frontally uh, because the situation was unacceptable where we had over 41% of drugs in circulation were outrightly uh, fake. Uh, when uh, the, uh, the presentation was going on, uh, he said something like uh, drugs containing no active ingredient. And I laughed because if a drug doesn't contain anything, it's better than anti anti diabetic labeled anti hypertensive and vice versa. 
because nothing was beyond them. Not only drugs without active ingredients, drugs with little active ingredients, drugs with active ingredients different from what is on the label because what happened was that when something like Novas, a popular antihypertensive, became scarce, they quickly, they quickly brought an expired anti-diabetic and we labeled it Novas. In fact, one of Nigerian senators brought our attention to it. He was a hypertensive patient. He took Novas. He collapsed, and he called me directly. We collected the medicine, tested, and found that it was an anti-diabetic, and so on and so forth. Drugs unregistered by NAFDA, uh, drugs that we are copying of original products. And again, when people talk about counterfeit copying, uh, well, it can be copied, it is made good. There is no good counterfeit. Why would you copy if you want to produce the right drug for people? And people forget that, you see, if you copy a drug, you may never get it right. In fact, you cannot get it right because the efficacy of a drug, uh, I don't know how many of you are pharmacists, is not only dependent on the quantity of active ingredients. It also depends on the quality, particle size, formulation technique, excipients, and other factors. So most counterfeits, or almost all counterfeits, are not good. So this question of uh, uh, falsified, uh, substandard, for me, they should all be called bad medicine. Because when you say counterfeit should be left for the court, no. Counterfeit concerns the regulator. In Nigeria, for instance, I never allow look alike or sound alike registration. Why would you want to call your product Novak? Because Novask is moving in the market. You can get too many other names as a trade name. Why would you want to put the same color as Novask? when you can get other colors. It is because you want to confuse the consumer. And you see, I am even more worried about the, uh, the, the, the attitude of the international community. I feel too pain each time I think about the unchallenged attitude of the world to drug counterfeiting or drug faking, uh, which is evidenced actually in our not having a harmonized definition Today, there's no harmonized definition. It's an eloquent testimony that generally the world is not interested. Uh, from 2002, the first time I came to speak in FDA, uh, some of you were there, I remember Dr. Benny Jones was there. I told them in FDA to please do something, be proactive, because if counterfeit medicine enters into US, you'll be in trouble. It's not just a matter of helping out some of us that have weak systems, corrupt systems, poverty, and others. You should also do it. Collaborate internationally to help yourself here in the US. And two years, three years, it came in, uh, seroptin, some of those drugs that we are faked in this environment. Every year there was an increase, and the purchase of drugs in the internet is not, was not actually helping matters. Uh, and uh, we also forget something, which I, I, I don't want to forget to point out, that resistant strains of antibiotics and uh, anti-malaria and similar drugs, they don't need visa to travel from country to country. If one has resistant strain of tuberculosis and the person comes into US, it gets transferred to people. Nobody even knows if I have such a, a problem inside me, I will still get a visa. So somehow we are so interconnected uh, in the global community that what has affects one country affects the other. So it's not just the problem of developing countries. Yes, we have a greater share of the problem because of weak system, corruption, uh, poverty, and others. But in developing countries, it's rearing its ugly head. But the good news is that uh, once regulators are uh, up and green, and they refuse to be compromised, the counterfeiters can be given a run for their money. When we wage the war against them in Nigeria, we have had, as I said, over 41%. They fought back aggressively. 
against me, against my family, against my staff, which culminated on a shooting attempt on me. Uh, it's a miracle that I am here to tell, to start to be telling you about it. And uh, we were able to bring down the incidence of fake drug by 2006, a report done by WHO and DFID to 16.7%. And drugs unregistered by NAFDA from almost 70% to 19%. And by 2008, before I left NAFDA in December to become Minister of Information and Communications, uh, 180 degrees, uh, we had single digits. But single digits is even unacceptable. Because we are talking about the human beings. And um, we had a good fight. They burnt, at this stage, they burnt all our facilities, laboratories, every day in place with the bond. You see, these people are so organized that they work in, in concert. They, they, they collaborate better than us. We regulators, uh, drug manufacturers, are, we, are, we are trying. The, the drug counterfeiters are always ahead of us. Always. They are aggressive. They are making a lot of money. A fake drug business is so lucrative that you see the, 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 their investment is unimaginable. It's even more lucrative or at the same level with that of illicit medicine. But the laws are very weak not only in Nigeria, in other countries, they know that the collaboration is poor. I, I shouted and screamed about international collaboration 2001, 2002. Eventually, I felt a bit comfortable that impact was put in place. After I had all already put in place WADRAN, West African Drug Regulatory Authorities Network, in our sub-region, I single-handedly did it. I called all the regulators for a meeting in Abuja and said, listen, hi, we have to work together. These counterfeiters from our records are migrating to your countries because of weak structures. We need to be advertising who and who is caught so that they cannot come to your country and reestablish and so on. And eventually, uh, they started working with us. Other countries in Africa joined us. Impact was established. WHO was the headquarters. But unfortunately, because of the lackadaisical attitude of the world to drug counterfeiting, impact is dying. WHO washed their hands off impact. They claim that uh, uh, definition is the problem. Now I heard the headquarters is in Italy. I think we are playing with human life. Uh, I will stop there until I can see that you want to move. <laughs> No, I'm, I'm looking behind me because I wonder where all those people are that are after you. But uh, your son is here, and he's about six foot four, so I think you've got good <laughs> protection. Uh, Dilip, uh, you're obviously looking at this from a somewhat of a different angle. Uh, India has been transformative in terms of uh, manufacturing a range of medicines that have saved a lot of lives over the world. Um, but it's often also cited as one of the places where some of the uh, bad medicines come from. I use even simpler terms. Um, can you help us uh, understand where uh, the manufacturing industry is in this? What role do you see them playing in, in trying to address the problem of substandard drugs? And, and where, uh, where is the responsibility of India as the home for some of the manufacturers versus Nigeria or some of the countries that are uh, importers? Thank you. Uh, I have two issues which I'd like to address in five minutes that you've given to me. So I'll be quick. Uh, first, the role and perspective of uh, Indian drug manufacturers. That's what you would like me to address. Before I get into that, let me give you a very quick overview of uh, Indian pharmaceutical industry. We have about 10,000 drug manufacturing units in the country. Out of that, about 200 are approved by US FDA. Half of what we produce in the country is exported to 225 countries. 40 percent of our exports are to the United States and Europe. And we started exporting to US only from 1998. Between 1998 and today, in terms of those units which have been approved by USFDA, 
not one instance has come to our notice where any of these 200 companies have exported either to Europe or to USA a counterfeit or uh, falsified medicines. There may have been manufacturing defects, but the Indian industry values this market both Europe and uh, US so much that that itself is a deterrent because they are looking for a long future uh, in these markets and they do not want to spoil their name. Now this is 200 companies but then there are 5000 other companies which even within India our two studies showed that 8 percent of medicines in India are substandard not falsified. Falsified is less than 1 percent. Now, these two substandard medicines are issues of regulatory enforcement and agencies. And many of the issues which were presented in the two, your presentation and uh, your presentation that uh, units do not have adequate equipment to validate the product is consistent with the quality it claims to be. Now, if you have units which do not cannot validate scientifically the product that is manufactured, it is bound to be substandard. Now, this is what needs to be addressed. Now, as the large manufacturers that I represent, our concern are one revenue loss because these manufacturers also use our brand names. This is the generic brand names because India is a branded generic market and flood the market. So, we run an organization of 25 investigators, very eminent people specialized in uh, crime investigation who worked with uh, India's intelligence uh, branch or uh, both domestic and international. And we as a group of industry try to track these manufacturers and distributors and prosecute them on an average we read about uh, three such uh, premises a month, but in terms of quantum or the manufacturing facilities that we have raided, we found that uh, that is minuscule compared to the size of uh, volume that we produce. Our second concern is it compromises India's brand equity, because even if certain other out of 225 countries some developing countries claim that all oh, these drugs came from India. It is a matter of concern for us because uh, it, it hurts our brand equity. Within the domestic market we have concern because it leads to loss of confidence among the doctors and the patients for using medicines of a company whose product is compromised. Therefore, industry's perspective is or role that we see is that we cannot leave and I am talking for India to drug regulators and law enforcement agencies only to face this problem. And that is how we have been running this campaign for last 10 years entirely funded by the domestic Indian companies. Secondly, we need to proactively engage in not only identifying sources, but also prosecuting them. Now, that is where uh, we have been very actively working with government and some of the amendments which came in the India's Drugs and Cosmetics Act uh, of whistleblower scheme or uh, death penalty uh, or triple damages of the quantum of uh, counterfeit uh, discovered is driven by the industry. Uh, second part of this question is expectation of industry in addressing proliferation of substandard falsified. We expect countries that we deal with where we export effective implementation of laws. Uh, there are simpler measures before we get into even track and trace system as uh, uh, issue of registrations or uh, uh, procurement systems processes that are followed. We expect stringent punishment to act as a deterrent. 
sharing of information, this is important to book culprits. And I would illustrate one issue with even US uh, uh, that uh, India has been facing. We hear from US customs repeatedly that uh, large number of consignments they seized, which I mentioned when we met in Mumbai, uh, come from India. I'll give a simple question. If you have seized that consignment, you know on the consignment who shipped it? What is the address of the shipper? What did it contain? You also know who was the consignee. So who in US imported that? What did it contain? What was the quantity? Was it 100 tablet, an internet pharmacy consignment? Or was it a container load of uh, tablets which came into US? Now if you share this information with us, and this is, I gave only an example of US, but uh, this is true for every other country. We seek this information from Africa. They tell us where these consignments came to you from. So that we have our own agency, we'll put that agency behind this, and we work very closely with uh, uh, police department and drug regulatory agency. We, and our laws enable us to book them under the offenses of cheating. We don't even try to get into the drugs and cosmetics act, but we book on the offenses of cheating and invoke criminal prosecution to book this uh, rogue manufacturers. And we urge countries to distinguish between serious and genuine manufacturers and fly-by-night operators. Now, some of our own government public sector organizations, like railways, what have they done to ensure that they get uh, quality medicines? In the criteria, they specify that the unit must be in existence for a period of five years minimum. So if it is a company which has just come up, will not qualify for supplying to railways. Indian Railways is a government run organization. Unless the company has a turnover of uh, say 20 million dollar. I mean I'm, Indian values are very small that's why I'm saying this. But what matters is the value limit. Unless you have that much turnover, you cannot qualify to supply for public procurement. Now if governments procurement in other developing countries. They were to institute such mechanism or a very simpler mechanism which uh, I mentioned to uh, various African delegates, delegations which came to India is you look at IMS health data and look at top 100 companies having market share in the Indian domestic market. And select as a supplier some of these hundred. This is a pub information in public domain, but buy from reliable supplier. And this will ensure that you get a consistently safe and quality medicines. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. So uh, we're going to open up for questions from you. Uh, so if you have some, um, get them ready. I want to, while you're thinking of your questions, start with one that I got by email uh, from someone who started a retail pharmacy chain in East Africa. Uh, and their comment is the IOM report doesn't really offer much for actual retailers. Uh, for instance, can we tap into global best practices? What technologies and processes, policies should we be putting in place? Uh, what funders are interested in ensuring that the supply chain down to that last mile that you talk a lot about uh, uh, is uh, free from pilferage and graft. So you have a lot of the retailers who are operating uh, sometimes in networks, sometimes literally down to the little Dukaladawa in the village. What does the IOM report have to say to them? Um, well, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call on Jillian for this after I've just mentioned a few things, but um, we suggest that national pharmacy councils um, can improve workforce efficiency. 
um, by assigning some pharmacy tasks to technicians. Um, and uh, we suggest vocational training in dispensing medicines combined with uh, incentives um, to train uh, and retain staff in rural uh, areas and slums. Uh, and so we do have a section of the report that is focused on retail, uh, on drug retail. Uh, it's not one of the areas that, that is one of the um, big um, headlines of our report, but we do have a substantial amount on drug retail. Um, Jillian, did you want to come in with anything further on that? We have microphones around. You could stand there. Um, I would, I think, refer the, the, the person who asked the question to the, there's a section in the report that talks a lot about medicines retail in developing countries that Larry uh, referred to. And what the committee suggested was that uh, governments in developing countries use the use tools to create an environment where the private sector can thrive. They believed that there are examples uh, from developing countries of uh, programs that did a lot to improve retail. The accredited drug dispensing outlet program in Tanzania um, it was very successful at um, bringing quality drug sellers to uh, rural and remote areas. Um, the report talks a bit about the Care Shop franchise in West Africa, which started in Ghana and it uses franchising to extend the reach of um, safe and trained medicine sellers to rural and remote areas. And they also talked a bit about um, using task shifting, using low interest loans, uh, using other tools, um, f that governments can use these tools so that uh, the private sector will be willing to invest in medicines retail. So. Thanks. So. Uh, I don't know where the microphones are. Oh, we have one in the back. Rachel's here. Um, questions from audience? There's one on the side. Hi. Uh, this is a little bit less a question than a comment. Uh, my name's Joe McKinney, and I'm speaking as a veteran of the, supply, of the track and trace industry, uh, which, in fact, uh, does exist. It's not thriving yet, but it's developing. And in fact, uh, there are technologies which and techniques which will protect the shipment for 100% chain of custody from the uh, uh, active ingredient manufacturing all the way through to the retail. Uh, these are not in use uh, in other than small uses, individual company uses, but the technology has been very much improving. Uh, smaller size, lower cost, better communication standards, and so forth. But the place where the most work has taken place is in the customs agencies. Notably, uh, while well one in the U.S. is DHS is currently running a safe and secure borders trial uh, with two trade lanes between Canada and the U.S., too, between Mexico and the U.S., and in fact, the chain of custody technology and the types of information management that are being used in that would be 100 percent applicable to domestic chain of custody uh, tracking if, if it was adapted, if the industry got behind it, and so forth. The good news about Africa is that there are a number of countries, and you mentioned Ghana and uh, Tanzania. Those are two countries that, in fact, are doing border management programs. The reason they're doing them is to cut down on smuggling. If a truck enters, for example, a truck uh, uh, containers unloaded in Mombasa, Kenya, and says it's headed to Kampala, uh, they, Kenya is also doing this type of a program. They want to be able to track it, make sure it stays locked, gets all the way to the border with Uganda, then it gets turned over to border. The World Bank has, in fact, funded projects in each of the five uh, countries of the East African community, and uh, they are now coming to the point where the, uh, the countries are issuing purchase orders. That was great to hear about Tanzania because uh, they actually have a very large RFP out right now for a program like this. Thanks very much. But in fact, from track and trace, there's a lot of technology 
that could be adopted and could be used today. Thank you. Um, Rachel, I think there's another question over here. Dora, while she's doing that, Nigeria, how, how secure are the borders in Nigeria? How does that work? What's track and trace look like? What do the technologies look like? What, what are the things that actually give you hope about getting a handle on the challenges in Nigeria? Mm, thank you very much. Our borders are very porous. There's a lot of corruption. And the counterfeiters are very ingenious. And I would want somebody to pass this around. This is supposed to be DVD player. It looks like DVD player, but inside it are uh, third generation antibiotics. So they, they, they hide these medicaments in uh, various types of things that you would not ever think of. Uh, coupled with corruption, it became important for us to do something to even prevent the countries that produce counterfeit medicine from importing them into Nigeria. And uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, most of the counterfeit medicine in Nigeria actually uh, come from India and China. Um, I was holding a discussion with uh, Dr. Shah this morning, and he told me that actually some of those drugs that are claimed to have come from India are not from India. But I know that we have traced some of them and traced them to India. And you see, we have a very big problem uh, which uh, this has given me an opportunity to mention. We, ha we don't have harmonized regulation. Uh, in some Asian countries, especially India and China, they have very stiff regulation for drugs meant for internal consumption, but very weak regulation for drugs meant for export. And that has actually yes, poor drug sure. counterfeiting. And uh, consequently, we started uh, inspecting factories to ensure that these factories, we check what they produce before they are allowed to even register. And we ensure that whatever drugs that are going to be uh, imported into Nigeria are used in country of production by uh, getting our embassies to work with the Ministry of Trade in that country, not only India and China. So we have done a lot to even stop the exportation from those countries. In fact, in Nigeria, you cannot even process import documents from the bank without getting clearance from NAVDAQ and so on and so forth. But at the port, uh, we are also very stringent. We have uh, uh, designated ports of entry. It's very important so that it doesn't come in from all ports. And if drugs come in from any port that is not designated, it is seized, whether it is genuine or not, and destroyed. We are strict as that. It's like at the extreme, because we needed to do something drastic. We also had independent analysts in India and China that recertify drugs and give documents to say that they have recertified. And if drugs arrive these designated ports without this uh, recertification, they are still confiscated and destroyed. So with these measures, we work on those countries where they are produced then work on them at the port, because once they enter into Nigeria, it's such a big country. It's so diverse that once it enters the system, it's almost impossible to mop up. But we also use uh, information from the public, from patients, from uh, doctors, and so on. And if we get such information, especially drug companies, they collaborate a lot, because we are not only working for the sick people, the poor, especially the poor. We are also working for the companies because counterfeiting provides unfair uh, competition. Because the, when uh, the counterfeiting was at its peak, multinationals actually left Nigeria out of frustration because they couldn't compete with counterfeiters. So when these companies find their drugs uh, co uh, counterfeited, they report to us, they work with us to track the drugs from wherever it's sold in the market or Drug distribution in Nigeria is another story. Okay. In fact, it's even hawked. Uh, hawkers used to carry drugs on trays, on basins, on their head, and sell in the streets and in buses, but we stopped all that. So the, what the point I'm trying to make is that uh, we need more of a harmonized regulation. Uh, if we don't have harmonized regulation and we keep... Uh, 
having double standard, it is still very difficult uh, for developing countries to handle this menace. Uh, again, let me quickly bring in. Let me hold okay. on one sec. Uh, right. Dilip, I think you probably see things somewhat differently around the different standards. But it, as you said, there are companies that are legitimate that probably operate on the same standards for domestic or export use. But you have a whole bunch of other countries that are maybe operating with sort of a different approach. Yeah, but Indian law, there are no two, two different standards for domestic consumption and exports. It's one drugs and cosmetics act, equally applicable, and there are no exceptions to that. Whether it's exported to US, or it's exported to Africa, or it's meant for domestic consumption. And in addition to that, when it comes to exports to US, the US FDA uh, acts as a, another agency, and not only US. We export to Australia, we export to Europe, we export to Japan. All of those agencies come, visit, inspect, validate facilities before they allow uh, these companies to export to them. So the Indian law is common for domestic as well as export consumption. And it sounds like Nigeria is done some of that inspection. There was a question over here. Yeah, yeah. hi, David Bryden with uh, results in the Stop TV Partnerships. Really fascinating panel, so thank you. Uh, my question uh, is about USAID's role in this area, and I don't know if Dr. Gostin or another panelist might be able to comment on that. And the reason I ask, when it comes up to tuberculosis, which our colleague from Nigeria mentioned, that something that we had results are very concerned about particularly in light of the very large cut that the Obama administration has proposed to the USAID TB program. USAID is doing good work in, in supporting countries to improve supply chain uh, management uh, and crack down on illegal pharmacies, uh, areas where countries really need that kind of support. So we're concerned that that, that, that kind of work could get scaled back if uh, the administration gets its way. So uh, apart from the issue around the budget, one of the questions that's come up a lot with CSIS is the question around how different parts of the U.S. government speak to each other. So you have uh, the PEPFAR program, which is managed out of state but largely implemented by USAID and CDC, and that's $4 billion a year, and a lot of that's buying uh, anti-HIV drugs uh, and some TB drugs. You've got bilateral programs for AID that are dealing with TB and malaria. So how does uh, FDA engage in, with its partners and, and helping them to ensure that the money that's being invested works well? Uh, and Larry, did, you, did the IOM panel look at any of these sort of large bilateral, multilateral outlets for US foreign assistance and whether or not there's a particular role that they could be playing either to change their standards or to invest in the kind of regulatory and manufacturing capacity that you cite as being needed? Uh, do you want to start and then maybe? Well, maybe I'll just let you, you want to start with the, because I mean, it wasn't a big part of our report. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'll start and then uh, others can fill in. I mean, I think that there is a lot of room for collaboration across government agencies here. And I think we're um, starting to invest more and more in that. One small example, which uh, we're proud to talk about, is last week we announced a partnership that we have with USAID, CDC, NIH, USP, and Skoll Foundation to um, test the CD3, which is a counterfeit detection device that uses different light spectra. So we're going to test that in um, Ghana for use in detecting counterfeit anti-malarial. So that was um, an example where we have a lot of different stakeholders who all own different pieces of this problem. And actually, Kate Bond and others get a great deal of credit for pulling people together there. Because I think there is really a recognition that these are interconnected pieces. And uh, I think we have a lot more room to explore how we can work there. But I think um, you know, looking at the fact that um, FDA has some presence on the ground, but other government agencies have more. USAID obviously has a strong role to play in um, helping to uh, provide products and secure supply chains are an important piece of that. So I think there's more opportunity there. So there's something that we could potentially do. I know the Global Fund, which also gets a fair amount of money from the U.S. Mm -hmm. to do TB, HIV, and malaria work. Uh, they're looking at some of the devices that are even mentioned in the report, the ones that use infrared analysis that are battery-powered field uh, Kate introduced me to, I thought her title was the Assistant Commissioner for Complaints, which I thought was a hellish <laughs> title, but she turns out she was the Assistant Commissioner for Compliance. Um, 
so looking at some of these new devices that are very CSI-like that really offer an incredible opportunity to uh, pop a pill in and basically use the infrared signature of the pill to determine whether or not it's got the right uh, active ingredients inside. Really uh, amazing stuff. And then there's the track and trace. There's barcodes. There's uh, stickers that can go on with a scratch off that people can call in. Consumers can call in. So there's a lot of things out there, but it still feels like if you step back, uh, uh, there are little bits that are trying to solve a very big problem that's probably bigger than any one actor can can get at. Um, other questions here in the front. It's actually two. Why don't you both uh, provide questions, and then we'll get answers. I think we're kind of together. <laughs> okay, my name is Rima Jew at Google. I'm with the U.S. Pharmacopeia. Um, the CD3, which you mentioned, is something that we're very proud of. Dr. Lukele will be, I guess, in Ghana with that. Um, to answer the AID question, there's somebody here who can probably answer it better than I. I'm not well-versed in the Protecting the Quality of Medicines program. Or, yeah. <laughs> But um, Dr. Lukele is, and so USP takes and leverage the standards that we set for medicine quality and puts that in the field to help protect anti-malarials, um, HIV, AIDS medicines, and uh, TB medicines. Um, I actually just had a comment, and then I'll pass it to you. It, it had to do with back in the report where you mentioned um, investing, you know, getting development organizations to invest in infrastructure. I would also posit that I think it's important to engage the ministers of finance within these countries, yes. because they're the ones mm -hmm. who actually um, run, for lack of a better word, um, the budgets of the ministers of finance to help address these issues. So uh, anybody on the panel that wishes to comment on that, we think it's very important. We're trying to pull together something. Hopefully in the fall we'll be able to do that. But yeah. While the mic's going over, you want to give a quick response? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, um, the report does talk about all of that. Um, and uh, we, we do see a, a, a primary role for uh, domestic governments, including uh, f uh, health and finance ministries, um, to uh, be supportive and, 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 and develop that capacity. So we mention that, more than mention it, we recommend it. Uh, and we also uh, realize that uh, in addition to what the domestic uh, role should be that the World Bank's International Finance Group and the U.S. government's overseas uh, private investment um, uh, corporation should uh, uh, begin to fund some of these initiatives. And so uh, capacity building is a very important part of our um, mandate. And, and we think of capacity building at the national and the global level, we, but we also uh, think of it in a way that uh, goes to capacity for regulators, capacity for industry, uh, capacity for law enforcement and customs. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a substantial need out there. And capacity building, of course, has always been the biggest problem in every area of global health. Thank you. Uh, th my name is Maria Morales. I'm with USAID, Office of Health Systems. Um, and to follow on uh, my friend's uh, comments here, um, in fact, we did support the development of the report through the participation of Patrick Lucalet, who's the director of one of our programs, the Promoting Quality Medicines Program, um, which is implemented by USP. Um, in fact, we have a, a large portfolio of activities um, through that program and through another program, the Systems for Improved Access to Pharmaceuticals and Services, which um, both programs complement each other in um, developing s the regulatory systems uh, within countries um, to address the issue of substandard and um, poor quality medicines. Um, we, this also includes work in the area of pharmacovigilance and uh, developing systems, uh, the capacity of uh, countries to uh, um, perform their, their responsibilities in the area of uh, promoting s patient safety and product quality. Um, to add to the portfolio of, of capacity building, though, I was wondering if the panel even could comment on the, uh, what, what you see as the, the relative importance of also working with the civil society, the, the issue of patients and consumer rights. I think it was mentioned by Dr. Autor in the beginning. Um, 
just the, the demand side. I, I think we have not been paying uh, perhaps enough attention to the demand side of the equation. And I was wondering if some of the panelists would like to comment a bit further on that. I could, or do you want me to? Sure, Dora, we want to provide a quick one because I believe you actually have your own box in the report with uh, some public education campaigns mm -hmm. that you helped mm -hmm. to foster when you were at the Nigerian oh. FDA. Yeah. So what's, what's your view of the role on the demand side of this? How much are patients responsible? How much can civil society help them uh, have a voice? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, it's not just a matter of what I think. A public enlightenment campaign is about one of the most effective strategies in combating uh, the menace of counterfeit medicine or in preventing them from having a field day. Because what happened actually in the past in my own country, why they were able to progress uh, from 1968 until we started the fight was because people were not even aware. My own younger sister who died from counterfeit insulin wouldn't have died. If we knew, you know, it was a typical counterfeit story. If, you buy, if we bought from shop A, her diabetes would, their sugar would go down. Then when that insulin finished and we bought from shop B, then it would go out of hand. And it never occurred to us that it depended on where we bought. It's like, is this witchcraft? You see, when educated people start talking about witchcraft, then there's a problem. What is going on? and so on and so forth. Or when you give antibiotic that a patient should respond and the patient does not respond, if there's no public enlightenment campaign, the patient would not suspect. So there was, uh, everything was uh, shrouded in secrecy, even if people suspected it's like, is it possible? So but when there's a public enlightenment campaign, uh, patients can at least ask questions. They can at least start checking the, the, the product label uh, we have aggressive public enlightenment in Nigeria where people check expiry date, check the manufacturer's name and address because some of these uh, counterfeits, they don't even have proper name and address of manufacturer. You can imagine a drug packet having PO box. And with adequate public enlightenment campaign, the patient is able to look out for what the person is buying, check properly, ask questions. People didn't used to have ask questions. So when uh, you are investing in helping developed countries, you should also think very much on how to use public enlightenment campaigns. Civil society can help, uh, but uh, regulatory agencies can also even help better in uh, uh, propagating uh, within the system, within the country, in the villages, in the schools, everywhere. It becomes, uh, it, it, it becomes uh, the issue on the front burner that everybody uh, should be part of the fight because it's not just a regulatory agency fight. It's fight for life by everybody collectively. Civil society should be part of it, but not just them. Uh, capacity building in India is a different dimension. Uh, we initiated, and this is the pressure group is the industry, that uh, we want our regulator to have capacity similar to, and we benchmark with USFDA. And what do we do to achieve that? USFDA has been very, very supportive. But our Ministry of Health has not been responding as it should to the USFDA. Offers of uh, various training programs, the responses are not there. So that's where the industry group has come forward and is putting pressure on the government that look, we, we benchmark and we want, in fact, currently we are working on that. That is a five-year uh, strategic plan that where India's FDA would be five-year hands. And we want milestones to be defined. This is one. Second issue we, we are asking with the government is transparency and accountability within FDA. Uh, and if you bring the transparency and accountability in the FDA, uh, things can improve significantly. And thirdly, by way of resources, there was a time, some 15, 20 years ago, when any new drug approval, I mean, new drug registration, not approval, I'm not talking about IND, but new drug registration, the fees payable in India were $2 
not even worth the cost of the paper on which the application was made. Industry initiated this and said look, look at the fee structure in other countries in Europe and raise these fees, we are willing to pay these fees so that all non-serious players are out and only serious applications are there. The fees have been raised to thousand dollars now from two dollars. But we demand a certain quality of service for the fees which we are paying. And our intention when we made this proposal to the government was that this money which we give you by way of fees should be utilized for upgrading the India's regulatory infrastructure. Unfortunately, as it happens, most of the funds collected go to the general account and then only comes by way of allocation from health. That never happens so in this country. That never um, so Larry and Deb, final comments on this and then we're out of time. So I wanted to give you all a, a chance to sort of make any uh, concluding comments because I promise I would get out of, get you all out of here on time. Uh, well, I can be quick. Uh, first of all, obviously, thank you again to CSIS for putting this together. I guess my thought reflecting back on this discussion is uh, what I often feel with a lot of um, the global issues. We have, they're huge and there are a lot of stakeholders and there are a lot of people looking at different parts of the elephant. Mm. And that I think that the IOM report is a good catalyst for discussion laying out a lot of different interventions. Um, we're suggesting thinking about them in the buckets of prevention, detection, and response because I just think it's easier to uh, hold a few things in our heads at once, but, but all these different pieces go into those buckets pretty easily. That gives us an opportunity as a global community to step back and say, where are the missing pieces? What are the networks we need to build? Where are the coalitions that we can create that can be effective to fill those gaps? Because I think that otherwise we tend to sort of double up in important, in important places but have big gaps otherwise. And so that's what I think would be a really important next step is to really think about the strategy going forward and making sure it's comprehensive holistic, efficient, and effective. Great, so the report calls on countries to develop their own strategies to build their kind of domestic response, but I think what you're calling for is a bit of a global strategy. Mm -hmm. Take the work that the IOM has done, but come up with a game plan to actually implement the recommendations. Um, yes, I mean, we totally agree, uh, and I think the prevention, detection, response is a, it's a really um, beautiful framework. Um, we do, we do, um, uh, ask for national, but we also suggest lots of global uh, and intercooperative uh, solutions. Intercooperative uh, meaning uh, uh, horizontal among countries, um, horizontal among different um, uh, stakeholders, governmental and non-governmental stakeholders, and then also international organizations uh, and, and others. Um, I mean, I might just say that um, you know, we do need this dialogue because it became very, very clear that when we talked to civil society, they spoke a, a particular language, and we did spend a lot of time talking to civil society. When we talked to industry, they had very similar language. When we talked to ministers of uh, health or, or FDA uh, regulators, we heard there, but there was very little um, uh, common ground uh, and so I think common terminology, a clear pathway on the prevention detection um, response side, and really getting the stakeholders together would be a great way to do it. And the international code of practice might be a great way to catalyze that because inherent in that, it has civil society pushing from the bottom up, it's got government engagement, it's got private engagement, and it's got uh, uh, civil society uh, and other groups, and so uh, I, I would, I certainly think that's the pathway forward. But I do think this is a solvable problem, and I do think that the IOM report puts out a number of things that, if we implemented it, it would not be perfect. We'd still have mm -hmm. problems, but we would go a long way um, in, uh, uh, in in lowering the problem, particularly in in low and middle income countries. Thanks, I'm gonna to turn to you two for very brief concluding comments while we're doing that. You should have on your chairs a little five by seven half a sheet of paper with a quick evaluation for today. 
Uh, it's a new thing here. Uh, so we'd ask you just to fill it out, uh, put a really high answer for the moderator question, um, <laughs> and uh, leave them on your chairs or, or hand them back to uh, Alicia in the back uh, on your way out. But leave them on your chairs, that's fine. That give us a little feedback uh, on today's event. Uh, Dilip and then Dora, um, and we're out of time, so quick would be appreciated. Very, very quick three comments. Uh, my top recommendations in closing comments. Dissociate IPR issues from action plan for safety and quality of medicines. This would help unite two sides of the industri industry, the brand name industry and the generic industry. And there could be a common program. The civil society would be on board. All governments will be on board as long as you move away patents and trademark issues from that. Second, move away from anecdotal evidence-based diagnosis of the issue by region and by country and get some serious evidence. India has produced such serious evidence in the last 10 years. And then you know what is the issue and then your prescription would be appropriate to the diagnosis. And thirdly, differentiate between driving forces for falsified medicines and substandard medicines. Lot of substandards in the, I will talk about India, in the country is because manufacturers do not have adequate facilities, uh, know-how, technical competence. This can be addressed by equipping them, by capacity building. Uh, falsified, the motivation is totally different and falsified needs a different action plan. Thank you. Criminal rather than capacity. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to key into what uh, Dr. Shah said about capacity building. Uh, developing countries, we need capacity building. In 2008, for instance, a, a very credible manufacturer in Nigeria used uh, diethylene glycol, antifreeze, uh, to formulate a product instead of propylene glycol. And the two products are similar. And this happened. 50 years after the uh, pro, uh, diethylene glycol tragedy of the US that actually led to the establishment of FDA. Uh, yes, uh, so if there? we can be helped One in second. capacity building, I think such errors can be avoided. This is not falsified. This is uh, a GMP error. Uh, but I want to quickly talk about a strengthening international collaboration. The criminals, I said it before, are collaborating. They are networking. They're always ahead of us. So we need to network and try as much as we can to overtake them because the issue of counterfeit medicine is solvable. Not solvable to go to 0%. It's like crime. You cannot take crime to zero. But if we can get it to a manageable level, it will be of great help to humanity. And they, very importantly, we have international convention on narcotics and psychotropic substances. Why can't we have international convention on counterfeit medicine? Uh, uh, illicit drugs are taken by uh, those that can afford them out of choice. But counterfeit drugs affect uh, innocent victims, violating the rights of those innocent people. I think we need to treat counterfeit medicine as an uh, international health emergency program and have harmonized regulation uh, by countries. You know, uh, like uh, I think I'm keen into what uh, the gentleman said. I'm on, uh, if we have a code, that everybody can key into. If we want to do it, we will do it, especially if a country like the United States takes a lead. We need to work together, not just regulators, uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, civil societies, and all. But I want to point out finally that the greatest problem of regulators is corruption. If a regulator looks at money and says no, the job is 90-something percent done especially in developing countries. And as long as a regulator is not compromised, that aspect is taken care of. We now talk about how do we cooperate so that the success of any country will not be an isolated success. It will be a success that will rub on all the other countries around and on the international community. Thank you. Thank you, Dora. Uh, before I leave, I would like to thank CSIS and IOM uh, for providing this opportunity and be here.
today with you and uh, I am sure Dura will join me in thanking Buddha organizations. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for and Dora thank, for coming. And, and thank Dila. you so much too. Yeah. Uh, so we urge you to uh, read the report. If you have suggestions for additional sessions, mm -hmm. please write them on the paper. Thank you for coming.